Welcome to Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I'm your host, Steve Ricardo, and today I am going to play you a fantastic interview that we did with Margaret Garrett uh, from Mr. Airplane Man, who now has a, she's doing a bunch of solo stuff with her own band too, and she's like, She's so cool. I mean, when you hear this interview, you're going to love it, you know? I mean, I, I always call Mr. Airplane Man Punkified Blues, and she kind of set me straight a little bit because the band is way more than just that. Mr. Airplane Man is the story of two lifelong friends, Margaret Garrett and Tara McManus, who met when they were 10 years old. Years later, they started a band egged on by Mark Sandman from Morphine. We talk about all that. They went on to record four albums and each. EP uh, for the Sympathy for the Recording Industry label, and now they have a couple other unreleased tapes that are surfacing, so it's pretty cool. They toured extensively, too, and they worked with a lot of good producers, and we had a lot of fun talking. And uh, before we play the interview, I'm going to play a song. It's an old, new track. It was recorded a long time ago, and Margaret sent it to me this morning. I, I'm calling the song Louisiana, but I believe it's Down by Louisiana, and we're going to play that for you, and then we're going to play the interview. Please welcome to the Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico podcast, Margaret Garrett. <laughs> How are you, Margaret? I'm good. 
good. It, it's great to have you in the studio. We haven't been able to get a lot of people in here in the last year, as you can imagine why. But lately, people are getting braver. So it's like, and we're very safe. So. Yes, I feel that, yeah. So how has it been for you, by the way, for the last year? Because I think you went to Europe right before the pandemic and did a solo tour, right? Right. So you came home and... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's been, you know, it's been okay considering what other people have gone through. I've been one of the lucky ones. And it's been, I mean, there's, it's, I think it was really rough right in the start. And like everyone else, there was so much anxiety and just depression just like came right in and not knowing. And it was really tough. And I like, you know, drank too much wine every night and oh, ate bad food. Too. I stopped exercising. It was, a, I was remembering this. It was a really rainy, dark April. March into April, like it was an unusually rainy. Yeah, it was. It was not good when the whole thing first started. Oh God, yes. It was just ugh. and but I think did, I, were you creative at all? Yeah, I think I had to eventually like ask myself like, how are you going to get through this? Are you going to just go down? Because <laughs> I think I did stop playing for a bit. You know, there was the whole not getting to be able to play with my band and. So, um, but I, I did kind of start lifting myself out of it in the spring started to, you know, happen. And that's very, always very uplifting. Um, and then I did start kind of holding up with GarageBand and writing songs. And, you know, it was in, in a way the silver lining was that I had a chance to really hone in on my songwriting on like getting like lots of different layers i was exp i was doing multiple guitar tracks and then i started like experimenting with like trumpet That's, sounds so you were and productive. i had fun now yeah. you were in la but you were back here before the pandemic right right i was going to ask you about la because i lived out there for yeah. a long time yeah. and on the phone you said you like la i love which is la good. i love la too many boston people go there and come back and i i didn't come back because i wanted to oh, i kept no. getting when i was working for labels i kept getting moved to new york and i was going back and forth and i wanted to stay in la and i still want to be in la so you liked it yeah me too <laughs> was it mostly because of the weather or well, the weather does have a lot to do with it, and I love like flowers. I'm th my <laughs> my reasons for loving LA are incredibly simple. I, I mean, I didn't really go out that much, and I have a, a son, and uh -huh. you know, I was really like a lot around just trying to survive and getting him through school and all that. But uh, I was a dog walker. I've been a dog walker oh, for the that's last a eight good years. Job. Yeah, and so I just be walking through these neighborhoods and encountering these incredible flowers at every turn and they're huge you know how it is like, oh yeah it's towering above you did you, you live at the beach or did you live inland or the valley or i actually lived in koreatown which i love oh Absolutely love downtown koreatown. downtown wow. yeah not a great like a little bit of an wow. unsafe that's, neighborhood but we loved it that's really yeah. surprising see i lived in marina del rey oh. and redondo beach and then i lived in studio city and oh. Encino. so i was away from yeah but i used to go downtown every now and then it could be a little i was the during the LA riots, so really, that was a reason not to go downtown oh, sure. in the 90s. You know, it was scary around there at that time. So, um, I have to bring this up because, uh, do you remember way back in the late 90s when I came back here? I used to come to the 1369 coffee shop and you were working there, and I used to bug you for extra lemons, which I squeezed my lemons in this iced tea that I have in front of me, but I do have extra lemon. <laughs> Nice. You were my favorite when you worked there. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, I'm so honored. Yeah. I'm that, always happy to accommodate those picky things because I'm very picky when it comes to how I like my coffee and tea. And Inman <laughs> Square kind of is where you started because a lot of people say that Mark Sandman was er involved with you early oh, on. Oh, sure, you know? yeah. Well, so the story is that um, before... Way before I hooked up with Tara in a band. Um, well, we've been friends since we were 10. Right. So, yeah. We, so actually, um, after college, I became a huge Morphine fan right around the end of college. And um, used to go see him play. And um, the funny story is that I went and approached him one day and asked him if he gave guitar lessons. Oh. And everyone's like, why did you ask him, <laughs> who's famous for his bass? And I was like, because he also played in the Hypnosonics, where he played guitar. Right. And I'm just going to mention that Hypnosonics, which is really one of my very favorite bands ever, they, are, wow. they just released their record of from, from back in the day, they, those recordings that they made. Did High and Dry do that? I think they did record it wow. in Dry, but it's just been released. And there, there was even an article and a, um, a, a 
segment on NPR about it. But yeah, so check that out. But see, I don't know much about them. Oh, Treat her right, I know about right. They were so good. So it was it was Mark Salmon's attempt to just work out new material and let it be totally loose. And it was like secret. They were yeah. quote unquote secret shows. You have to do that when you become a star, right? <laughs> but it made it so great. It was so intimate. It was at the Plow and Stars. But anyway, I got to know him through that. And then um, he agreed to mentor me, you know, and he really did become one of my greatest mentors to this day. He's yeah. And um, at one point I said, I really want to start a band how do I go about this? Do I like put an ad in the Phoenix? And he looked at me and said, you need to just travel, like get out of Boston, just travel. Good advice. And that led me to the only place I knew I could easily just go and hang out for a while, which was my best friend, Tara, who was living in Arizona. And I just went out with my dog and my minivan and we just ended up in um, Arizona. And then I played for a little while with Tara's friend, who was a drummer, and that just, like, after a while, I just couldn't relate with where he was coming from, and I was like, Tara, we have this long, you know, history of, like, we were, like, punk rockers together, going to the Rat. She moved to Arizona after Mm -hmm. school or something? It was part of school. She went to this college out there called Prescott College. She lived in Prescott? Prescott. Yeah, that's where we lived, and I lived there for a little while, too. Kind of rednecky there, isn't it? (laughs) I've been there. yeah. Yeah. I lived in Phoenix for 18 months, and I remember going to Prescott, and they had the saloon doors yep, yep. and everything The there. Old West. Yeah, that's really... I think it was like hippie slash redneck, So, because her college was this experimental. Like, they had no grades, and everything was... So I think you could find, like, different pockets right. of free-thinking people. I was kind of generalizing. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 that. no. It was a little like the Old Jerome West. is near there, too. <gasps> I love Jerome. Me, too. Driving around there, and it, I, I'm a huge Arizona fan. That's Did really you play cool. in Phoenix a lot? That was really the beginning of playing with another person, period, the end. I mean, or, well, I had a band back in Worcester, a trio, at the end of college, but this this was like... Did you go to school in Worcester? I did. What school? Clark. That's a good school. Yeah. Shitty neighborhood, but good Shitty school. Na- yeah, exactly. I loved it there. We're going to talk about some Worcester guys later on in okay, the show. Okay, all right. But so anyway, long story short, Mark had sent me out into the world. He's like, go travel, go have experiences. I think he saw that as a little green yeah. <laughs> in many ways. And that, and it, to, this, to this day, I agree with him that the way, I don't know, to expand yourself musically is just get out of the house, ha- go for a walk, Good go advice. have experiences, read, meet people, have stories. What are you going to write about? And even what are you going to play about if you don't expand yourself? So that was really great advice. And that's where I ended up, Tara just started you know, playing drums to play with me, to play together. And that's how Mr. Airplayman started. And then we moved to San Francisco for a little while. And then we came back thinking that we were going to go busk in Europe. That was our dream. We were like, we're going to move back home where our families lived and save up a little money and go to Europe. And then I got a job at 1369. Wow, you did all that before? Yeah. Johnny Strange, man. I I met him. (laughs) I showed up at 1369, met him. And we asked if we could play busk outside 1360 as our very first busking gig because we were a little intimidated about wow. going all the way to harvard square wow for people out there around the world that are listening inman square is right on the somerville cambridge line it's yeah. a c- cool little neighborhood very cool. yeah. that a lot of people don't know about but from other places and that, but here and it used to be a jazz bar right yeah, uh, plus SNS Deli had the In Square Men's Bar right, there, that's right. which was a cool uh, alternative type club in the eighties. Yeah, for my time, a little. Yeah. So, Mark's the to, just to make the full circuit. So, I ended up asking Johnny for a job. He he helped me get hired there as a barista, right? Right. And to this day, the best job I ever had. Loved that place. And then um, one day, Mark Salmon walks in because he used to go there and get oh, his I'm coffee. Oh, sure he did. Yeah. I can't remember. Oh, man, was it like an espresso? He probably had a very specific thing. There was a lot of celebs in that neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. So he walked in and he's like, you're back, right? Because he sent me out and I had this, you know, I was like Dorothy coming back. And I had this whole thing happen. And then I was like, yeah, I'm back. And I have a band now with my best friend. You took and, his advice. And I said, you should come. And we're playing at Toad, you know, because at that time we, we had a show upcoming. And this is probably 98, 99 yeah, around exactly. then. Exactly. Yeah. It's probably 98. And then... um. He showed up at Toad. He loved it and said, Why have you made any recordings yet? Which we'll segue into. <laughs> yeah. And we, uh, at that moment, we hadn't or we, yeah, hadn't anything really formalized. And so he invited us to come up to the loft. And that's where we made that first record with him. 
Wow. I was going to talk about Sandman. I had that written down here. Well, here we go. He really like helped. So this morning you surprised me when you sent me an MP3 of the song Louisiana. And thank you very much. Mm. I can't wait to hear the backstory on this song. It turns out that song was one of the really earliest recordings that you did. Tell yeah. us about that. Because the, right now, it, it, people have already heard it because we played it before you at this interview. Right. So tell us about that. Right. So this would have been around the exact same time I'm talking about with meeting up with Mark again, which was that Tara and I had this rehearsal space at... Hummel Vision, which was the recording and practice space of John Hummel in uh, JP, like okay. right around the corner from the Brennan Bean. And we, I think we might have met him at the Bean. I'm not sure. We used to hang out there. And, and early on, we were getting shows there. And um, this was such a cool space. And it had a really interesting vibe. And then we always were like, it feels really haunted. We had like a lot of weird experiences. Turns out it was haunted. <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of it. And um, But yeah, we had sort of segued from just busking all the time and playing out in the street to starting to like have a space where we, you know, we're working songs out. And then... At some point, um, Hummel was his, his nickname, um, asked if we wanted to record there. And he brought Joel Simkis in, and then they recorded us. And did, We practiced by the way. Joel's last name before we yeah. started the interview. We got it right, Simkis. Simkis. <laughs> Joel's a cool guy. He's such a cool yeah. guy. And, you know, I just want to say that at the time, uh, Tara and I were, uh, I guess, well, we still are really critical of everything that we record and do. But at the time, it would just we weren't sure that it really represent us or it was right or the right sound and it sort of got buried all these years we were like yeah maybe we're not going to put it out and then i just discovered it in the basement as i was starting to slowly clean out my parents basement and get you know another thing the pandemic helped with right that's right (laughs) exactly and there it was and i saw the box you know we had the two track and it said you know john hummel and joel simkiss and the all the recordings and I thought, oh my God, this is so cool. What does it sound like though? So I had them transferred at Q Division, which is where I'm recording my solo record. And we had the digital transfer and I checked it out and I was like, oh wow, this is pretty cool. Really beautiful sound, you know, and I I have no idea what myself of 20 plus years ago was thinking. Not Both. wanting to release it, but now I thank hear you it. for sending that this morning. Yeah. I, I and can't. I'll just I just want to give a quick um background on that actual song because it's significant louisiana down in louisiana so when tara and i first moved back that year it was like 97 or 98 from some san francisco Uh back to here we started going to the green street grill oh all the time and we would go watch the tarbox you played there a lot actually probably too yeah later on yeah, yeah after we um but we would go watch the tarbox ramblers and absolutely enchanted by everything they did and it just um so i actually asked Michael Tarbox for some guitar lessons and he helped t- he actually is what taught me that all that you know um slide playing and the blues we, yeah, riffs and he stuff he did we would listen to a lot of records and he would show me what he knew but that song down in Louisiana was a song that the Tarbox Ramblers played now they played it a little differently he had that hanging on that really cool riff and then it went to the it went to the four you know it it changed but i thought just that riff alone was so enchanting. I just wanted to do the whole song with that one riff. So I, I sort of just like so made it a little one easier. So was it their songs? Well, it's a like a traditional. Like, oh, I didn't know I, that. I actually don't. Yeah. I got to credit whoever but, wrote it. But 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 they. I I learned it through them. Nice. Yeah. So you don't know who originally did it. I'll, I'll we'll we'll figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I just put Louisiana down as the title. I right. didn't realize it was down in Louisiana. Down to, down to Louisiana. And I spent a lot of time down there. I oh, used to have you? a girlfriend from Metairie, which is right outside of New Orleans. And it's uh, Darren Hill, who was in the Red Rockers, and he became the, he managed the New York Dolls replacement. He's coming on the show next week, mm-hmm. and he's from Louisiana. Oh, cool. So it's going from one Louisiana story yeah. to the other. Oh, nice. So, um, so just... I'm going to go a little bit ahead here. Sure. So you guys ended up putting out four albums and an EP on the West Coast based Sympathy for the Recording Industry label, which is a really cool label. How did that all happen from here? Oh, okay. I'll try, I'll, I'll try to do the short version. Uh, well, we were big fans of a lot of the Memphis bands on Sympathy. So like the Compulsive Gamblers, the Oblivions, Jeff Evans, all that stuff. And they're all in Sympathy. And when we... 
um, played a show in Memphis in the 68 Cadillac, <laughs> which Mark <laughs> Salmon was the one who told me to go buy a Cadillac, by the way. We pulled into town, and we were like, that car was noted <laughs> by you Jeffrey Evans. You got a 68 Cadillac? Yeah. and he noted. He's like, okay, what? who's the... <laughs> Who's associated with that? Because he's a Cadillac man. And uh, we, we went to, um, we played a show at the High Tone. And he a was good there. Club. Yeah, he was there. And he invited us while we were we were in Memphis for a couple of days, maybe a week before we went down to Louisiana, played some shows and came back. And then um, he invited us to, to record at his, his uh, home studio. And we recorded Red Light there. And then he sent it to John and said think you're gonna dig it and then john called us and was like let's put this and out and you stayed with them for a while as a matter of fact john is going to put the uh hummel vision recordings that we've just been talking about from 1998 the very first recordings we ever did even before mark salmon he wants to put it he's going to put it out in vinyl that's fantastic yeah, so because look out for that that'll be coming i out. i have uh you know my memory's not that great either but you know come on dj i love that record you know red light was 2001 moan in 2002 come on dj 2004 then you took a little break and then 2008 jacaranda blues did i say it right yeah. jacaranda blues and um, L.A. Plus, you have another EP that's kind of yeah. on the low right now, and you you, ho- you hopefully will be releasing it. Maybe? Oh yeah, no, we'll definitely release it. So that was our last recordings we did, um, and we just hadn't had a chance to mix them. And then I've been at Q Division. Is that going to be on Sympathy too? Um, I don't know yet. We we're we're still trying to figure out what's going on with that. So that's a little okay in the works. I didn't mean to throw a curve. No, no, it's all right. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's yeah. We're, I'm really excited about it. It sounds great. It's a five song EP, and uh, it'll definitely be coming out. I get to hear some of it. It sounds awesome. <laughs> I mean, I'm a fan of the band. I wanted to ask you a little bit about okay, any reason for me to talk about Detroit. I love Detroit. I love everything <laughs> about Detroit. Every time I go there, it's people are like it's so scary there. I love it. Jim Diamond, who mm-hmm. you worked with, his studio was, was in between two abandoned buildings. I've been there several times. You made the Monin record there. Mm-hmm. When you went down there, that must have been kind of trippy for you guys to record when you found out you're pretty much in an abandoned city. Because at that time, they weren't rebuilding Detroit. Yeah. Did you stay at one of those raunchy little hotels around there? Or? No. Um <laughs> Oh my gosh! That's... I stayed at a couple of those Did hotels. You? Yeah, the Charms were recording there, and they were there for like a week, and so I went out there. But what was it like? Because you know, it made sense though, because Jim had done the two first White Stripes records, right. and not that you guys are exactly like the White Stripes, but there's a couple similarities going on right, there. Right. So did is that why you went to Jim Diamond? I mean, I think it it might have. Um, been suggested by john at sympathy or we just loved his work so maybe we i i can't remember how exactly if he approached us if we approached him i mean it seemed like a natural it's a perfect match i mean jim and you guys together and the record's amazing it was so great working with him he just he's phenomenal you like in your own world when you're at ghetto it's gone now unfortunately oh it's so sad i have very few like complete memories of like recording sessions but i actually remember recording jesus on the main line i remember being in the room and i and i had this kind of feature forward moment where i was i was looking at the tape rolling and i was as we were playing it, it was the take you know like you, you know you can sometimes feel it it was very magical the feeling in the air the sound he oh got he got amazing that sound. two inch machine he has two there is legendary and i was actually visualizing as we were making the song <laughs> hearing it coming out of speakers in into the future and it was somehow also connected to the past like it was a great moment where i felt just past present future all connected in one moment and he created that kind of space he really did he was really good at getting all the sounds just right and then kind of sitting back and letting your magic just he's a 24 7 guy for sure jim diamond i mean i were a hard working guy yeah i mean i loved working with him that's why i had to ask you about that did you um I mean, when you were, did you like, did, did, are you, fam- you, I'm sure you're familiar with all the history of Detroit, Motown, and all the great garage rock bands and everything. Did it, make, did it give you that feeling oh, when you're definitely. in Detroit? I, I really believe that. I really believe any place is filled with the ghosts, past 
and present of what the music, you know, all the music that happened. I felt that way about Memphis big time, too. Yeah. And in Boston, you can't deny it. There's so much good music that I feel really this gratitude to have been born here and just come into this scene. In fact, I wanted to mention, I, I listened to some of your past episodes. They're so Thank good. Thank you. I so <laughs> enjoy hearing. I'm so, I feel so lucky to be uh, doing one with you right now. But um, I was listening to the Mickey. My pleasure yeah. completely. I listened to the one with Mickey Bliss, who I love. Yeah. I love. And by the way, the last show I played, the last time I was on a stage playing a show it was at the Cantab Club Bohemia March 7th it was <gasps> right before the pandemic wow yeah in fact there was a lot of nervous feeling in there and not a lot of turnout and unfortunately it was a great show and it was a great night but you know we all felt this impending doom and it was the last time I was in a club <laughs> I loved it when when I gave Mickey the option about whether he wanted to come in or not because it was still kind of a shaky time and he's like I'm definitely coming in, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> so he came down, and we're old friends. I've known He's, him since, well, you probably heard in the yes, interview. We go I didn't way know back. That. It's College so cool. radio. I was playing his I didn't know that. Cocktails for Two <laughs> single. But he's a really cool guy. He's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I call um, just a little more about Mr. Airplane Man. To me, I call you guys a punkified blues band. Do you feel like that's a good way to describe your band? I mean, I know you've changed now. The newest stuff I heard is definitely evolving more away from the Howlin' Wolf kind of sound of you seem like punkified blues. Isn't it? Well, I, that's that's a dimension of us for sure. And that one that I think a lot of people have latched onto. I mean... You know, between you and me, like, I know the history of Tara and I and everything we've loved and listened uh -huh. to and been influenced by since we were 10 years old. Yeah. And when I think of that, I was like, well, yeah, but our first, one of our first um, influences after, well, punk rock, we were punk rockers together, hanging out at the Rat, you know, like going to shows. Um, but we also just loved Morphine and Hypnosonics and Mark Salmon. So there was this... I think that lo-fi kind of thing. Well, it's lo-fi, but it's also like beautiful soundscape, low rock, mellow, you know, like subtle um, and, and like really groove based. So there's I think there's like, oh, and then we were really into like King Sunny O'Day. I remember a mixtape a friend made in high school and had King Sunny O'Day on it, you know, and and Saccharin Trust and, and the Minutemen. Like, Saccharin Trust? Yeah. Wow. And so okay, if you talk about Saccharin Trust... I wasn't trying to put you in a well, specific no. category. Right. <laughs> but that I understand that tendency. for. But what I mean is, sure, we, we like... But if you look as early back, um, even on Monin, like with Not Living at All, which is, by the way, a huge tribute. Like that was our... our that was my attempt to do like a Help You And, which... You can't oh. sound, it doesn't sound like it, but it's a chord progression is like almost the same, you know, but it's done in a really different way. So I feel like the influences have just been, for us, there's just many, many, but that's what I think a lot of people maybe latched onto, which is fine, but I think there's- You're multi-dimensional. I think so. Yeah. And when I think of what both Tara and I, like what we're listening to now and what we're doing, it's just, there's a lot of different- stuff going on i mean she's been like she's like learning how to do that ethiopian stuff on farfisa like come on how cool is that <laughs> that is pretty cool yeah. well it's a good segue that you brought up help you in because i was going to talk about the liars oh, yeah. because the last two times i saw you were at liar shows and uh you know both dave and steve are good friends of mine i mean i know i know jeff too and 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 paul but i Dave and Steve, you know, they're from Worcester, and I grew up in that area, too. And Steve and I went to college together. Oh, man. And I used to go see his band, Crazy Jack and the Automatics, on a regular basis. I was almost like their groupie. You know, I was their groupie. In fact, they were one of the first punk bands I ever saw. It was 79. I was wow. a teenager. And there was the Blue Moon Band, the Lynch Mob, the Worst, which, by the way, was Rachel Levine, Duke Levine's sister. Oh. Yes, wow. in the worst. And um, so I got to know Steve a long time ago, and I was so happy when I heard in the 90s, I think it was, that he ended up in The Liars. And now Dave is a very good friend of mine, too, Dave Spaz. You know, he's the bass player. And those guys, so you must have a thing for The Liars because so, you went to their last two shows. The last show I went to was January at the Middle East, right before the pandemic, and I saw you there. I said hi to you. Was I a print dancing? You were with Steve. You were talking to oh, Steve. Oh, I was Aquino. talking to Steve. Okay, so I'm going to quote you now, and I won't get it completely right, but you said, 
um, in one of these episodes, and I think you were talking to Rick Hart. I'm not sure, but you said that Steve Aquino is the most underrated, like, great rock guitar player. I mean players. that. And I'm going to just say I completely agree with you. Wow, thank you Absolutely for... Absolutely one of my yeah. guitar heroes. He's just doesn't... He's not fancy. He just no, does the he job. He just does it. And he just the way he looks when he's doing it, he's just completely in it. And he's really calm. He just stay. He's like, he's really grounded. And he's just doing this mind blowing stuff. And it's so good. And I, and he's so humble and just real good person. I just, I adore him. You don't have to sell me on Steve because yeah. we were hanging around together in college and he turned me on to punk rock before anybody. Also, bands like The Animals, Sir Douglas Quintet. Oh, he love, had a really great collection of records when I met right. him and I was like dude you got all these records I never heard before right. you know because I was really young you know so like this Sir Douglas Quartet that's an example of music I absolutely love and have been influenced by you, I don't... she's about a mover yeah <laughs> that could be about you <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you well you are well, a mover <laughs> yeah well that's so the, that's a huge influence too so like all that stuff is there and that's what I love about the liars too not that they reference that but there's so many great great so much great music I've gotten turned on to through them like the outsider you know the Dutch outsiders and so are there other bands from that era of Boston garage bands that you also like I know you mentioned morphine and uh, tar tarbox and yeah. are there are a lot of other bands or did well, the you real like... kids of course yeah and the nervous eaters well that was a little before my time did you get to play with the, any of those bands oh the real kids we got to play with oh, a yeah? bunch of times when they and and they're phenomenal just like I didn't get to hear them back in the day but when like when the last show we played I think was at the midway and you'll have to forgive me that I don't remember the year you don't have to remember <laughs> I think I told you on the phone that there's an unreleased Real Kids album. Oh, oh my God. When I heard that one song, Somewhere West of Nowhere, that Rick Hart put out on the Ace of Hearts story, I was like, the rest of the album's amazing. You know, he gave me a test pressing of it. Shh, don't tell him. I just told oh, the whole world. Oh, you just world. told the whole world. Okay, everybody. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know why it hasn't come out. You know how it is, man. Things happen. I do, there's I do. reasons behind shit that we don't know, I don't you know. know. But um, no, yeah, they're I phenomenal. I mean, I I I I I had a feeling you were going to say that about Steve because he he is like he is underrated. I mean, he's we could really say underrated. it over and over. He's again, so good. You know? And why is it? Does he? It's who knows why, but he's so good. Isn't it funny how the liars have two guys from Worcester in their band? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is funny. Oh, but I'll have to. I just have a quick, great, real kid story. Um, so I got to be friends with them through David Woods, who I don't know if you know. He's he is he yeah he's a no, no, he's not a Worcester guy. Okay, forget that part. But um, so uh, it was um, going to be, my, it was my son's birthday and he tur he was turning like, it was quite a few years ago, but um, Woodsy, as we call David Woods, had a little surprise. He he took us to uh, the Real Kids Practice Rehearsal Space where Whoa. they were all, yep. Because, oh, I forgot to mention that, uh, you know, I play records at home and my son really gravitated towards the real kids. He loved them. Really? Yeah. And this How old is quite, your son? He's 15 now. Uh-oh. <laughs> so he's listening to, no, he listens to really, he's got great music taste. It's different than mine. A lot of it. It's a lot of hip hop, but I love it. He's really in rap. He's really got good taste. But, um, but this was back then, I don't know, probably like five years ago. I think it was before he moved out to LA. And um, so maybe he was like 10 or something. And so as a surprise, we drove out to the their rehearsal space and we and, and they all sang happy birthday to Harlan, my son, and gave him a record and autographed it. And they asked him, hey, so what kind of music do you like? And or any songs, any requests, any songs? And he was like, you know, oh, God, what do I say? And he'd also been really getting into the Beatles. So he mentioned the Beatles and then they played some Beatles songs, but like real kid style, it was, it was amazing. So we hung out in the room with them while they played us some songs. So good, such good guys, you know. On that unreleased record, there's yeah. a cover of Baby Blue by Badfinger. Oh, Which wow. is almost a Beatles song. Wow. <laughs> but, I mean, George I'd Harrison produced it. So. Yeah. But, um, well, now I want to segue into your solo stuff because I spent so much time listening to all your new material and things you've done in the last few years. To me, a lot of it's more dreamy and psychedelic, but you really pull it off. And um, I couldn't decide what song to play because <laughs> you sent me a bunch of really good songs and I'm going to play Dance With Me in a little while. But there was something you mentioned 
that you were channeling uh, Lee ha- Hazelwood and Dusty Springfield on the song Clouds. Yeah. And I thought that was great because Leah Callahan, who was just on recently, yeah, her I old band that. Betwix did Sundown, which was Nancy Sinatra and Lee Hazelwood. Oh. So that caught my attention. Yeah. So you listen to a lot of that kind of stuff, too. Yeah. I, I, I Well, I've always... Um, I've always loved good songwriting, I guess. I mean, I sort of my very first record ever as a kid was um, Nielsen's The Point. I don't know if you're familiar with that record. Nielsen, but, yeah, of Well, course. you know, Nielsen, but that whole record, I memorized it. And, you know, I loved it through my whole, I still have it as a record. <laughs> but um, I've always loved arra- good arrangement, good songwriting. And in a duo, That you know, there's a limitation to what you can do with that. And those limitations are great. It, it allowed us to do all this just super cool stripped down primitive sounding stuff and you know and made great challenges for when we wanted to do more layered but you know now that i've just been in my own you know creating my own thing it's been really it's been really fun to to work with um different influences that i've had which includes the birds and gene clark and yeah lee hazelwood and um Serge Gainsbourg like I, I like French pop I mean I, good one. yeah I'm, I'm all over the place in a way but I, I got to do a little bit more of that um when I sort of hold up in my basement and and just did everything in garage and then what happened was I, I made a whole bunch of songs this summer and then um thought like you know, I, I recorded most of it to a click and thought, you know, it'd be really cool to put drums on these. And I've been working with this great drummer, Gregory Porter, who's um, who I knew from the band The Concerns. And I just want to give a shout out. They're one of my favorite. The Boston. Concerns. Yeah. I don't know. I was living in Pittsburgh yeah, for a while, okay. so I missed out on some stuff. But what are they like? Oh, God. Because, um, of course, I'm going to go look them should, up. Absolutely soon. should. Yeah. <laughs> Well, interestingly enough, you know, Greg's a drummer, I think, first, but he plays guitar in this band. I love um, multi-instrumentalist yeah. guys. <laughs> and there's no drums. So it's, and they sometimes will add a drum machine. But, um, you know, he had started coming to Mr. Airplane Man shows, and that's how I got to know him. And then we did a show together. Um, right before I left for tour, I wanted to, like, get some songs together for this, you know, tour throughout Europe that I'd do. And um, I asked him to... Uh, help me figure out how to record it because he had sent me some concern songs and I loved this the way they sounded and he had been part of recording it so he got his friend Jim Reynolds to come and record me and then I ended up using them as a backup band for a bit and that was in the last uh, year or two we played together but on the solo record I kind of just wanted to put drums on what I had so I invited Mm -hmm. him in the studio and we did it at Q Division and it's just been like He's he's it's it's been really good. Yeah. You've been able to work in a lot of really good studios over the years, <laughs> I gotta say. Yeah. Q is a good great place too. Well, and know? I just have to say that the guy I'm working with, Rafi, so far is amazing. He's an absolute genius. So So you're in the middle still of doing stuff? We're at the end. We're you're just finishing end. it up. Mixing. Yep, we're mixing. Awesome. We're really at the end of mixing, so it'll be coming out. So um, it seems like you're a perfect person for doing a balancing act. So I think you'd be able to balance more than one project. Where do you see yourself going in the future now? Are you going to balance the two things? Or Uh, you mean the band and the solo career? Well, I think the solo career is going to be always with a band. Like I I, I will be playing it out. We'll probably do like a record release this summer. Uh Um, and have Greg on it and um, and some other folks to, to you know round it out. Um, but do you mean when you say the band, you mean Mr. Airplane Man? Yeah, Mr. Airplane Man. Well, so Mr. Airplane Man is definitely still um, closest to my heart. But I could tell by the expression on your face. It's too bad this isn't on video. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the moment, we can't actively play. Um, because Tara has been struggling with a chronic illness, unfortunately, and it still continues to be a challenge for her. Um, and definitely when she can, she she's, keeps playing her Farfisa. She's like still involved with music, but uh-huh. as far as like actually being able to get together and, you know, do a full rehearsal and, and playing out, it's just, you know, it's an unknown. So just continue to like pray for her healing and and getting better and just also just have to accept if if this last year has taught me anything (laughs) it's that you know we have to just accept things as they are sometimes and just be do our best to um you know be patient and 
and find the silver lining wherever that is what's the silver lining you know what can we so one of the silver linings is that we do have we found these old recordings and so far we've had great reception people have been really supportive i'm sure it's going to get yeah. better and better and then we have this great ep that we're going to be putting out it, um we're still figuring out the details on that but it's it really is it sounds amazing i'm like i'm really happy about it we're really yeah. happy about it I got to hear some of it, so I love it. Oh, Thanks. you know what I wanted you to mention? Your band camp, because yeah. you have all kinds of stuff. So why don't you tell us, I mean, they can, can we find everything there pretty much? Yeah, um, as it comes out, sure. So right now, the new um, the Hummel Vision release is there. And then when we um, do the vinyl with Sympathy, we'll sell records. And also, by the way, Monin's been out of print, or it's we haven't, uh, it's not been circulated but we're gonna we just got some back stock coming our way oh vinyl yep nice and also the shaking around ep that you asked about and uh, at one point and the johnny johnny single we have like records are on you the way john's gonna, <laughs> john's gonna be sending us some records so we'll have stuff to sell really excited about that and then as far as the summer like um I'm actually... Uh, Hopefully we can have gigs and stuff. Well, right? actually, yeah. And there's going to be um, an outdoor venue opening up um, at the New Notch in Brighton. Oh, really? Yeah. And where we might be doing our record release. And it's a really cool space. And it's like mostly outdoors. So it's going to be safe. You know, really cool space. I see a lot of outdoor shows happening this summer, you know? It's going to be great. Yeah. I think it's going to be like the summer of love because people <laughs> are like been cooped up and they're all going to be coming out. I talked about this a couple of shows ago. People are going to be like taking their clothes off and like, you know, it's going to be 1969 all over again. Wow. We didn't really have I a summer. I love this vision. <laughs> well, last summer we didn't have a summer, right? So yeah, good point. You got to make up for it. It's going to be really ecstatic. I feel like, yeah. I mean, it, it, just coming here this morning, it felt so good this i mean it's always so uplifting and and re, you know this positive energy of spring it's such a you know hopeful thing well i have i have a new segment that i just came up with on my way here and you're going to be the first one and it's called what's on your turntable <laughs> Like, what is the last thing that you remember listening to? Because I know you have a turntable. Yep. So w the last thing you listen to. That's a great question. I'm so <laughs> glad you asked. So there's this record that um, Gregory Porter, who's the guy I've been playing with, who's on, uh, an amazing drummer, he um, made this record with this guy, Sidney Linder. And it's like Sidney Linder in the, the Silver Wilderness. And this record is, it's just like, I'm obsessed with it. And it's so good. So I don't know how, if you have like links that can go up or something, but you should check it out. I'll, so it's, I'll, I'll put it up there. Amazing you, songwriting, um, beautifully recorded. Just, it, in fact, I'd say that it was, I, I heard it back in the summer. I think I heard it back in the summer. And that was a huge inspiration and, in, 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 you know, some of the songs. I imagine you have like a whole wall of records at your house. <laughs> well, it's, I'd say it's in the basement. So it's in like, that's my space. That's my, my little getaway space. Isn't it? And then my son started taking it over with his friends and now they're going through my records. Uh oh. Yeah, no, it's cool. Actually. I kind of like it. Like they're like discovering, you know, <laughs> being teenagers and what all that means. Too bad people can't see yeah, the handsome. I know there was a handsome <laughs> there. Um, and they pulled out the Led Zeppelin, you know? Oh. Yeah. And then they even pulled out some of my like, um, Zomrock records and just like getting into so you have a very shit. eclectic collection I'd say, yeah probably maybe yeah yeah i got about 1500 records at home Whoa, and, uh, well. i had a lot more but i ran into some financial trouble a few years and ago and sold like, records i wish hey. i didn't sell but, oh. Oh, that's but there's always some that you never will sell that's no right. matter what that's right right for sure for sure well, thanks a lot for coming on the show. This was fun. Oh, I've been wanting. I've I've had you on my list for a long time, and I'm like, I hope oh, she says yes. I and just you did. really appreciate that. <laughs> That's so great. Well, I'm so glad you had me. It's really fun talking with you. And uh, yeah. you know, I wish you nothing but the best, and I hope I get to see you play out soon. Okay, cool. Margaret Garrett, thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> with me 
feel so free All right, that was Dance With Me, brand new solo song from Margaret Garrett. It was so great having Margaret on the show. There was a lot of things that we didn't get to talk about when we were talking about while we were walking outside. She wanted to mention Triple Thick, Mitch from Triple Thick, a great Boston band, because she just feels like their bands were like so connected. Same with the Conks, you know, these are some really cool underground Boston bands that Mr. Airplane Man came through the ranks with. And um, she didn't mention them, and I wanted to mention them for her because um, I also wanted to mention, and, you know, I wanted to say this while we were doing the show, and I did it, and I mentioned it to her afterwards, Margaret Garrett has the best legs in rock and roll. (laughs) Had to get that out. (laughs) I remember when I used to go see Mr. Airplay, man, I was like, man, she's got the best legs in rock and roll. And when I told her that, she was very happy to hear that. And she still does have the best legs in rock and roll. She probably always will have the best legs in rock and roll. (laughs) All right. How many times have I told you about Baby Loves Tacos? I mean, they're like the best thing to come out of Pittsburgh since Andy Warhol, Bruno Sammartino, and Roberto Clemente. Everyone has a bridge named after them in Pittsburgh. I think they need to need to name a bridge after Baby Loves Tacos. They have two outstanding locations. One's in Bluefield. One's in Millville. Right over the 40th Street Bridge. Because people don't know where Millville is until you tell them to go over that bridge. Then once they get over that bridge... They got Attic Records. They got Baby Loves Tacos. Baby Loves Tacos doesn't get much better. Baby Loves Tacos where everybody eats. All right. Next week, I didn't even tell Nick this. He's going to hear it now for the first time while he's pushing the record button. Darren Hill is going to be our guest next week. And I'm like extremely excited. Darren played in the Red Rockers, played in the Star Darts, played in Clover, But that's not even half the story. He went on to manage bands like the Dropkick Murphys, the Mighty Mighty Boston's, the New York Dolls, and someone he's been with for a while, Paul Westerberg, and of course the Replacements when they went back on tour a few years ago, when Dave Minahan joined them. So Darren's going to come on the show next week, and we're going to talk about all of that. So I'm really excited about that. Um... 
Please support this show and check out the Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Twisted Rico. If you want to reach out to me, it's twistedrico at gmail.com. You can find us on Instagram at Blowing Smoke with TR or at Twisted Rico. There's a Facebook page. There's a Twitter page. There's even a Tumblr page, I think. Uh, we, we also... We also have the Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico YouTube page. Please subscribe and hit the like button. I hear people say that all the time. Now I'm saying it. So uh, thank you, Nick Z, here at New Alliance East for doing another unbelievable job. Until the next time we say goodbye, this is Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I'm your host, Steve Ricardo. Keep the rock and roll alive, and we love you, Busy Phillips.